Guys, to kick things off, to make Monday interesting, to make Monday cool, I saw a video over the weekend posted by Captain Michael Van Leer. He's a port superintendent over at Hap Egg Lloyd. Oh, wait, maybe he's not a captain. He's a port superintendent. Uh, maybe on his way to be a captain. But he posted uh, this video right here of four 20-foot containers being lifted. Can you roll this tape? What's really unique about this is, first of all, I mean, it just shows you how massive, right, the scale of logistics is. Is that thing going? Roll that tape. There we go. It just shows you how massive the scale of logistics is, but what's especially unique about this one is right here, so you're seeing 40s and 20s, and pulling up a double stack of 20s, you know, any port can do that. But when you see this come up, what this is carrying on is four 20s in a stack. And it's crazy to think, because it's just got a bunch of little locking pins holding those things in place. He's going to bring it right up here, over. I don't know. These guys have to rule at the claw game. This is uh, over in Rotterdam, as I mentioned. For those of you who are unaware, Global Trade is measured in TUs. One TU is one 20-foot container. So uh, usually you see this in, like, data and stats of the port had you know, 100,000 extra containers or whatever. Well, when they're talking about that, that's what they mean. It's one 20-foot container. The 40-foot containers, the ones that are as long as 220s, those are called FEUs, and those would count as 220s. Pretty cool stuff, though. Good work over at the Port of Rotterdam and excellent work by Michael and his team over there. Raymond Ryan, he is representing the Port of Jacksonville. He said, very impressive. When quad lifts were first introduced, it took the terminal some time to figure out the landside operations. It seems easy. Just lift the boxes up and put them down, but it doesn't require significant coordination. Amazing stuff. Anybody who says logistics is boring needs to, you know, stop looking at charts. They need to go touch grass. They need to go to the ports and realize that logistics is a world that is moved by massive, badass machines. Um, also, hey, speaking of ports, shout out to the Port of Jacksonville. They were very excited before this weekend's game. We got a tape on that. Oh, oh. Go Jags. Go Jags. Yeah, uh, it didn't work out, though. Didn't work out for them. They tried hard. Valley and probably like the only good playoff game over the weekend, um, unless you count the last play by Dallas last night where they tried to use Zeke as a blocker. Not great. On today's show, I got CNBC's Lori Ann LaRocco. She's going to be talking about the trends in global trade that are flashing consumer weakness. New Year, same cargo theft. Traveler Scott Coronelli is going to share the latest data on what's going on on there. And maybe he'll tell me uh, where you can get one of these sting trailers that he sent me, because that's really cool. Um, bad markets invite big scams. We've got Echo Logistics. Chris Mayberry is going to come on. Also talk about the Dallas logistics scene. Patriot Freight Group's Andrew Salazar. He moves them big warp pipes around. We'll be talking to him about the logistics of oil fields. And also, you know, we're hearing about all these places that are firing thousands of workers. He's actually hiring some people. So we'll ask him what's going on over there. We got some incredible gantry cranes I just showed you. Demolition Man becoming a reality. Boston Robotics versus OSHA. And way more. But let's tip the band and start getting to some guests. Did you know that AIT publishes a global transportation market report every month? So if your business needs information about air and ocean trends, carrier updates, economic forecasts, North American trucking, and customs clearance news, you can get all of that in an easy-to-digest overview. Best of all, it is free. The newest edition is already out, so go to AITWorldwide.com and go get yourself some knowledge. But right now, we're going to talk to Chris Mayberry. Introducing Chris Mayberry on this show, client sales executive over at Echo Global Logistics. What is up, my brother? Uh, you know, man, just uh, hanging out, talking to a beautiful man with a beautiful beard on this uh, fine, more, you know, f fine Monday morning. If you I will. can. I have a wider screen than the audience. If they can put him in full, what is over to the left of you? You got like a balcony over there? Well, that would be your right. What do you got? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so working. Yeah, working from my house today. Uh, working That's remotely. Nice. Do, do I do have that uh, that that sweet setup with uh, with Echo Global Logistics? So we're the Dallas office right now. At least, and this is most of Echo is 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 now partly remote. So we're you know three days in the office, uh, Tuesdays through through Thursdays. I'm you know luckily due to my tenure and and size as a rep, I, I do have full full sign off to work you know remotely. So I get the I get the kind of the blessing to be able to 
you know, bring my kids to school in the mornings and pick them up in the, in the evenings. But yeah, this is my nice little loft space. First, first house I've ever bought, uh, you know, thanks to echo and, and, and some hard work over the last six years, uh, that we got to move into last year. Well, yeah. So did you, very, very cool thing. Echo just opened an office in Dallas, if I'm not mistaken. And it got yep. me curious. Look, we've been hearing a lot about layoffs. People out here in the community, this is a show for people in the community. They they know their friends and neighbors yep. uh, in this field are getting lost. What's the Dallas scene like? People looking for a change, new change, great opportunities. And those of you who did get laid off, there is a little hope out there. I mean, the unemployment rate is still pretty low. There's still a lot of companies out there hiring as bad as it may seem right. on the, uh, the tech side. But what's good in Dallas? Man, I, you know, there, there's no shortage of, of businesses to 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 sell into and to to work with here in DFW. I, I can say for myself personally, you know, from what what I've seen in terms of a lot of growth, let's say out of the Dallas office in terms of accounts, things like that, if that's what we're talking about, um, a lot of it's coming out of Austin. There's some really large growing companies out of the Austin area. Um, you know, definitely in DFW, uh, not too far from me. We've got a lot of business parks uh, in kind of the Flower Mound, Louisville area as well. Uh, one of my, uh, you know, kind of previous clients, uh, not too terribly far from me, um, that, that I did quite a bit of work with over the last three years, kind of got killed on the uh, the extreme length side of things whenever whenever uh, those rules started to change after the pandemic. Um, but yeah, still going good. The office is awesome. We, uh, you know, we kind of jumped around a little bit. We were at, we were at, Ross Towers, where we were set up originally uh, for the Dallas office, which was nice. Don't get me wrong, but it was like old school Trump Tower nice, if you know what I mean. Like, you know, kind of gold plated. Everything was probably awesome in the 90s, right? Um, mm. Then we moved spaces for a little while when we lost our lease. Uh, just didn't wasn't a good good fit for Dallas. Um, landed at the Harwood, uh, Harwood district and finally just got our new kind of permanent space for Dallas built and set up. I would love to, at some point, uh, you know, show you guys what that space looks like. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. We're pretty excited about it. You need to restart Gats. I haven't had a reason to go to Dallas since uh, the, the pandemic took rid of Gats, man. That's, that's unfortunate, but I do need to get back out there. Last time, uh, last time I was out your way, it was actually in Austin, but it's, it's cool to see because in Texas alone, you have massive growth in Austin. You have massive growth in Dallas and you have massive growth in Houston. There's a lot of opportunity out there, right. but you know what a, a market like this also presents? It presents opportunity for bad actors. And after I talk to you, I'm going to be talking to travelers about physical cargo theft, but on your end and from your view, usually where you see the scams, it is happening before the freight is even moved, right? What are some of the cargo scams that brokers are pulling off right now? Well, the most recent one I heard, uh, this this came from a story of, I want to say somebody who works at Echo, um, but basically what the scam looks like is they you typically typically is connected to open, open load boards. So DAT truck stop, things of that, of that nature. So they're calling in, they're pretending like they are a carrier that you already have established typically within your system. So they're kind of, they're bypassing carrier compliance, right? And we've got carrier, sure, we've got carrier 411. Um, so it's not like we don't have the ability to, to, to do the background checks on these companies to make sure that they're legit. Um, and basically they'll move the load, right? So they're, they'll take the load, they'll, they'll, everything will look, right from the get from the get-go and usually it's just a slightly different email and so you got to really make sure that whenever you're booking you know loads especially from a from from an open load board make sure that the email that they reach out to you on and the email that you're ultimately sending the rate confirmation to that all of those line up those those also need to be matched up with whatever you have within your system previous especially if it's a previously established uh, carrier um but they'll take the load let's say for $5,000 for a cross country load, <clears throat> they'll then hire on another either 3PL or, or asset based carrier for 6,300. They'll have the load picked up, delivered. Um, they'll get PODs, right? So they're going to send you the POD to just to let you know that it get delivered. So then they, they get paid. You send that, send them that pay, that payment, right? And then they ghost, they disappear. And so now you're, now you're not just on the hook for 5,000, you're on the hook for 5,000 plus, you know, another 6,300 that they, that they promise to that asset based provider. So wow. that's, that's one of the more recent ones that I've heard, heard it. I was just like, holy, shit. I, I've got to, 
I got to post about this because people need to know uh, about this because it's it's not like a typical situation, right, where they're just going to try to get information, show up, steal your load, and then take off, right? It, it seems so. It could seem so legit. You're getting the PODs. Uh, everything seems so so similar, and yet just a little. It just takes a little bit of a little bit of a missed detail, and you could you could be out thousands of dollars on one single truckload. So, I mean, how, it, this almost sounds like, you know, how you have to be hyper vigilant with phishing scams. They try to spoof company emails or your boss's email. You've probably gotten a text from your fake boss telling you to go buy gift cards or stuff like that. Or the emails. I mean, in yep. emails, if you, if, you start, if you start being observant, you can sort of just tell that's, that's the wrong email. What is your tip to people out there to avoid a scam like this? What are they going to be watching out for? Yeah. So, again, I just make sure that your emails line up. Yeah. Uh, you, and as, again, especially it, if you've already got that carrier set up. So, like for instance, again with ours, the the story that I think I heard, I believe they were already they were already pre-established. They'd gone through carrier compliance. We had a specific email for them, um, and I'm not even sure if it actually if it all went through. But it it may have been that they even caught it. But basically, what happened was, you know, they reached out to send the rate confirmation to the email that we had within the system, and then that carrier followed up with us and said, "Hey." whose load is this? Like, why are you sending us a rate con? We don't have a truck in this area. Um, and so it was just, it very quickly was like, Oh wait, this is a problem. This is these, this is a scam. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that would be my big thing. I would be hesitant to get on the phone with people. Um, if you're going to post a load, I, I prefer to post if let's say you're going to use DAT, and I don't use DAT a lot. I, t I typically, I, I rely much more heavily on our internal load boards at echo through, you know, clutch and the systems that we have. But if you're going to do that, what I prefer to do is use an email. And then that way I can, when I get an email from those carriers <laughs> and, and right now with the, the, the market being down, you're going to get a lot of, a lot of inquiries very, very rapidly. Uh, I think I counted 147 emails on one single load that I posted from Indiana to Texas oh, wow. in three to five minutes. Um, <sighs> But make sure, just make sure though that that email matches up with what you have in your system before you go through the process of rate confirmations and things of that nature. And of course, like if, if you're if you're fortunate like me, where I'm not I'm not a cradle to grave rep, right? I've got a, a whole carrier team to support me. Loop them in, get get those guys involved. Um, don't you know? Don't try to be a hero um, and rely solely on yourself unless you have to do that. If you're you know if you're a cradle to grave rep and you're you're familiar with the process, then just make sure that you've got a good process in place that you're not going to wind up getting scammed out of money. So, is there any any recourse, any that anything can do if you happen to be a victim of this? I'll be honest, I I don't know. I can't speak yeah. to that. Um, you know, from me, from what it sounds like, it just sounds like you're you're kind of you're going to have to take the hit on it, right? You know, again, like either way, you're out of time I'm and not, money. I mean, it's you're yeah, yeah. at the very least. <laughs> And, and and it's going to make you look bad, right? Like the 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 hardest thing, right, is this this industry is so based on trust, so based on relationships. So if you if that mistake happens, right, you're going to have to now now you're going to have to also deal with the pa the possibility that that client's going to go, can I trust Echo? Can I trust this broker? Can I trust this agent uh, that they're not going to lose another load for me? You know, do they have a good enough process in place that's going to keep my freight safe? And it's going to get it from point A to point B without these problems. Yeah, shippers remember that. I mean, carriers remember that. Shippers remember that. Your customer, they're looking at that. They're looking at that. And 3PLs remember this. They're looking at your logo. They're not looking at the 3PLs logo. They're going to think that your company has not right. done a great job. 3PLs bear a lot of responsibility in that. I mean, and this is a whole conversation we get into on supply chain as a marketing device and supply chain as a customer retention device. But those are, those are both valid things. But before I let you go, because I have to get deeper into crime on the physical side of it, which travelers i do have a trivia question for you because it's your first time here are you ready all right yeah shoot for it go ahead. all right this is from okay boomer okay. it's from the millennials category it's an entertainment it says what is the name of the cucumber in veggie tales is it larry oh you you got it you got it you know your veggie <laughs> had you got this wrong i was gonna be like well he's got to at least know the name of the pickle in rick and morty right that that actually don't I don't know I don't know the pickle in Rick and Morty, but my brother in law is a huge fan. Okay, well the pickle's name is Rick. 
So we got Rick and Larry. Easy enough. <laughs> Easy enough, Chris. Chris, people want to connect with you. They want to learn more. They want to not get scammed in the brokerage, or they want to learn more about Dallas and the freight scene and uh, and start talking to a guy like you. Where do I send them to? Well, I mean, they're more than welcome to hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, you know, check out my LinkedIn profile. Pretty easy to find. Chris Mayberry, Echo Global Logistics. Um, or you can go to echo.com, right? It, you can make an inquiry there if you want to specifically learn about Echo or a specific process. Obviously, you know, as a rep, one rep of, of many uh, in Echo Global Logistics, I think there's over a thousand uh, of us guys. So, you know, if you already have a rep, obviously reach out to them. I'm, I'm happy to communicate any additional uh, of my own sure. uh, information that I know or, 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 you know, experience that I've got happy to jump on a call with any other, if it's a new rep, things like that, that maybe they're not aware of. Uh, that's one thing Very I do cool. love about echo is that or there's a big, there's a great team dynamic that we've got here. I bet Chris, thank you very much. Take it easy, sir. Take care. Thanks, sir. Now, one of the things people always talk about, you know, especially after on this show, after I have autonomous trucks, I, I always get some heat and, you know, don't encourage taking our jobs away. Um, automation is an interesting thing. You know, my, my take on it is that brokerages are going to get decimated by automation well before trucking. And one of the reasons I highlight what's going on in automation and trucking is you can see what is happening here and the difference between what is happening in some industries. For example, now and meanwhile, we're going to take a look at fast food. Take a look at over at Panera what's going on. Welcome to the Webster Panera. My name is Tori. Are you a rewards member? Yes. Full automated ordering. And now over in Minnesota, Demolition Man was right. Everything is Taco Bell now. Not everything is Taco Bell, just the Vikings. No, this is Taco Bell. This Look at this Taco Bell. It's automated. It's got like these bank teller things. They drop these things down. It's got that AI board where you order from. Um, they still do have a human service attendant there if you're looking through the tape. And I'm sure there's workers in there. I don't think that's all fu fully roboticized, but it's pretty clear Welcome what direction some of the what direction some of this stuff and some of those processes are going. Uh, fast food is only going to get... Weirder. And if you're one of the people who hates going into the store and like ordering from like the giant iPad with people's ketchup fingerprints all over it, well, life's only going to get worse for you. So bear down. Anyways, it's got Cornell. He's laughing about that. He must get grossed out by the touch screen, too. It's got Cornell National Practice Lead for Transportation Crime and Theft Specialist over at Travelers. Scott, I got to thank you so much for uh, the little bait trailer that you gave me over here. Yeah. I love that it even has a sticker on it. Yeah, I promised it to you. I promise you. You know, obviously we don't put a big sticker, or, you know, a giant sticker on the back of our real one, but uh, <laughs> but that was a dead giveaway. You see, you, this, the the one thing the sticker prevents me from doing though is opening this, and I was curious, like, if there was like SWAT team agents in there, surveillance cameras, or what. There's. I'm I'm always listening, buddy. I'm always listening. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, welcome back to you. welcome back from the new year we're going to talk about uh, theft trends um we did talk about that you know in december has anything changed did people did thieves have a different idea of what was going on over the holiday season um i know truck stops can uh, be a tough place for some drivers yeah and i know i noticed you were talking to your previous guest on you know that what we've talked about in the past which is strategic theft and we'll talk a little bit about that today but there's there's really no surprise that we've seen a certain amount of carryover from where we left off in 2022, which is why I thought this would be a good topic to kick off the new year together so we can kind of get ahead of the curve on this. So it's a really good time to take a look at some of the increases and the trends and, and the shaping, you know, that are shaping up for 2023. So, you know, I think understanding the trends is the first step towards helping protect yourself against cargo theft and, and trying to prevent it in the first place. So to understand the trends, we usually partner with CargoNet, which is an industry leading uh, source of incident data. They do a really good job of putting together what's voluntarily reported to them. So here's some of the numbers that they're reporting and the, that they saw. So overall, theft was up 15% for 2022 versus 2021 and 31% in the fourth quarter alone, which is why I thought, hey, this is going to carry over into 2023 and be good to talk to, to Dooner about. So that's really nothing to sneeze at. And when you consider in 2020, cargo theft went up 29 percent. You know, we're seeing that constant increase since 2020, really take into account that in 2019, as an example, the average value of a single cargo theft was one hundred and thirty nine thousand roughly. And in 2022, wow. it was up to two hundred and fourteen thousand. So that's a significant jump. And that, you know, theft like that can really set you back. So when you take 
that reported number of thefts, which they had for this report, 1,778, which remember, that's just a sampling. That's not all cargo theft that takes place. It's just what's reported to them. You're looking at a total dollar number of 223 million in total losses for the year across the industry, just in that small reporting sample, right? So now for the regions and the key areas uh, that we see hit, usually California always jumps out. They've always been in first place, Texas, second, and we're seeing a little bit of an increase in Georgia as well. Wow. And, you know, even cargo theft isn't safe from inflation with those with those big jumps that we're seeing. <laughs> what are what are thieves yeah. targeting, though? I mean, and, and, you know, that actually ties into it. You're talking to economic reasons. Thefts do go up in tougher times. That's just the way of the world. But what are what are they targeting now? I know traditionally we mentioned a lot of like cars and electronics and household goods were, were all big categories in 22. Correct. So household goods still jumped back into that number one position, followed closely by electronics and then food and beverage. And those three commodities really continue to dominate uh, pretty much all the way around. Right. We're also seeing a a considerable jump in the targeting of loads of vehicles and auto accessories, auto parts that you had mentioned. You know, keep in mind the golden rule we've talked about in the past. They're going to steal what they know they can sell. So we know that cars and car parts we're in shortage and in big demand through 2022, right? So it just makes sense. So where where is this happening, though? Like, do I have to be most vigilant in the truck stop or do I need to hire a guard dog for the dock or put up bigger fences? Where Where are the thieves striking? The really big concern is kind of what you touched on with your previous guest, that what we call strategic theft. So we yeah. see that big jump in um, the targeting of freight brokers and intermediaries. It's gonna be somewhere around, I think, 600% increase in that kind of targeting, really big jump in the numbers. And so right now, you know, that's going through the roof in a very short period of time. And these thefts appear to be, you know, they can happen anywhere because they're doing those sort of remotely, right? They're doing those from their their computer. uh, And so they can commit those types of thefts all across the country, but we're really seeing it heavy in California. Uh, which, as I stated earlier, leads. Uh, Outside of that type of theft, we're showing most of it happening outside of warehouses or near warehouses, distribution centers, parking lots, truck stops. They remain the most targeted locations. That's always been pretty much the common thread for those. Keep in mind, something we've discussed in the past quite often is these organized groups are going to follow trucks away from the distribution centers and the warehouses. Right. So that's that's going to be in the language and the reporting, you know, warehouse distribution center. But they're really going to follow them away to truck stops or parking lots or, or you know, company yards, things like that. And and wait for that opportunity to steal the load when the driver's away from the load. It's a very common MO specifically in Southern California. But again, it happens everywhere. You know, I'm glad that before you came on, Chris kind of set the table for us, because I think in your head when you hear theft, there's this sort of caricature of a person on a ski mask with a crowbar just cracking open trailers left and right, where it's really gotten much more sophisticated, where people within email before this load ever goes anywhere already knows what's in it and where it's going. And if they haven't stolen money on double brokering, they have maybe routed it someplace else. But one thing Chris didn't know is what to do when you have a loss. So I think that you might be able to tell us. Sure. The first thing you're always going to want to do is call 911. We tell, you know, we always recommend call 911. Make sure you you call and report it to the local police directly uh, and always do that. That's always your first step. You know, unfortunately, there's been, you know, a shrinkage really in the dedicated task forces or law enforcement across the country that really specialize in cargo thefts, especially since the pandemic. There's still some out there. And those task forces, you know, Florida, California, Memphis, uh, Kentucky, some others, they really work really hard. They do a great job, but they're, you know, they have limited resources. So they'll do everything they can. So make sure you report it to the local law enforcement. And if there is a dedicated resource in that state or that area where the theft has occurred, that's going to be much better for you. Um, when they see increases like we're seeing, you know, that adds to the workload, right? So, you know, we've recently seen some involvement with Homeland Security getting involved in this too, which is great to see. That's encouraging. In general, you know, it's tough out there for resources. So you know, with us, we talk about in the past, uh, you know, we have that dedicated cargo theft team, that special investigations group that that our clients can call directly and they'll work 24-7, 365 to go out and, and investigate these type of losses for our clients. So if you have that resource, there's also private investigators out there and that's in this space that specialize in cargo theft. 
There's only a handful of them uh, that are really known and, and really, really, really dedicated and good at this. Uh, so again, you're going to have limited resources. It's really important to have a plan on, you know, what are you going to do if you do have a loss and what resources can you get in touch with? So look, low resources, high theft. What are you supposed to do, right? What's the best line of defense against cargo theft right now? I think one of the things I really wanted to stress today is you have to have a plan, right? Mm. If we become a victim of a theft, what exactly will we do? You know, who will we call? Who's in charge? Who at the company is going to take point on leading the effort in a theft? If something happens in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., you know, your overnight dispatcher gets an SOS call from a driver saying, hey, their load's been pilfered or worse yet, the whole thing's been stolen. Then what? Does that dispatcher really know what to do? Do they even know who to call? Right. You have to have that process in place, especially right now with these increases and, and that stuff you know, that we specifically talked about that's targeting freight brokers, things like that. There's a little bit of a distance there, right, because you've hired a carrier and then they, maybe the carrier gets ripped off or maybe it's a bad guy and not a, not the carrier that you thought it was. So who do they call? Do you even have an overnight dispatcher? Is there somebody for the driver to call? If you are that intermediary and you're that freight broker and your arms length the way, do they know who to call? Even if you're a trucking company, you're asset based. Is there somebody that that driver knows who they can call at two o'clock in the morning? You know, um, do you have all the information that you need when that theft occurs? Do you have the bill of lading? lading? Do you have the serial numbers? Do you have the the make model of the tractor trailer? You know, all that information needs to be available immediately when you report that theft. You can't report a theft, not have any of those details, and then wait to get those details. You have to have that plan in place. Very, so, very cool. <laughs> yeah. So let's give our audience an example, right? Let's pretend okay. that you're a driver who discovers that your load has been stolen while you're inside eating very late night dinner at the truck stop. And, you know, I'll be the dispatcher and you call in the middle of the night. Okay. You're okay. Wait. So I'm the trucker. You're the dispatcher. Right. Yeah. Okay. How realistic should I make this truck driver? <laughs> <laughs> let's let's make it audience friendly let's but, but, but somewhat realistic right i need to speak to dispatch all right so so you know what did you have to eat first of all is what i want to know you didn't have the meatloaf right because you don't No, because i'm a vegetarian right. no, i'm just kidding oh, I there you chicken. go and you don't eat chicken. meatloaf unless you know mom made it right so so okay so you want to talk to dispatch so okay i'm dispatch here i am all right and then all right. Well, I'm at a diner in Roswell, New Mexico, and I don't know where the heck my freight's at. Yeah. So what do you mean? Well, it's gone. Mean, my load is gone. It was aliens or a thief. I don't know. It's missing. <laughs> so like it's stolen. It's completely gone. Yeah. Look, I, I pulled over. I was eating the chicken over here, not eating the meatloaf. And I come back outside and the load's gone. All right. Do you have the bill of lading? Uh, no, the bill of lading was in the truck. What do you want? You're lucky I wasn't in the truck. I'd be missing too. Do you have the serial numbers? Do you have the trailer number? Uh, the trailer wasn't ours because, you know, you did a hook and load. Do you have any of that information? Hey, why don't you call the broker? What do you, what do you mean call the broker? How am I going to call the broker in the middle of the night? Did you call the police? I can call, well, call the police? No, I didn't call the police. I should call the police. So there you go. Yeah, you should call the police. <laughs> So there you go. Right. So let's go. Let's just go to bed and we're going to figure it out in the morning. And, and you know, as as funny as that sounds, you know, that's sometimes if you don't have a plan, that's all too common. Right. So remember, reporting time is crucial. Uh, so many victims of theft wait anywhere from three, four or more days to report, which is a terrible idea. You know, sometimes we hear, well, we thought maybe it would turn up or we thought we could make some phone calls and make it appear. Always, you know, be safe. Report that right away. Get all the resources you can involved right away because that delay in reporting could mean the difference between recovery or not, right? After you make that call to 911, who can you immediately get working on the recovery regardless of, you know, where it is, how far the bad guys have already moved it, doesn't matter. Who can you get involved in that? You're going to want to make sure that you've aligned all the right resources. You know, again, I mentioned earlier, if you're a customer of Travelers, we're on call 24-7, 365. We've recovered over $85 million in stolen goods for our clients. So, wow. so you really guys, want to start to rally in response. You guys heard it here. Failing to plan is planning to fail. Great advice. Yeah. Go check out Travelers. Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate your time today. Always good to talk to you. Thanks for having us. Take care.
All right, now we got, hey, this is my buddy. He sent me a hat recently, too, and he even put, like, a custom dog on it. It's really cool. Andrew Salazar, he's a CEO over at Patriot Freight Group, and he's a, he's a man that lives by the credo that Mike Tyson said. Everybody's got a plan until they get smacked in the mouth. What's up, Andrew? <laughs> What's up, Nooner? How are you? <laughs> What's happening? Where do you hang out for people who haven't met you before? Where, uh, where in the world are you based out of? Uh, we're based out of Houston, Texas. Oh man, prime, this is uh, this has been like energy a, land. This has been a very, very Texas-based show. I had uh, the guy from Echo on earlier, Chris. He's over in Dallas. You're holding down Houston. I had some Austin guys on. For those that don't know, what 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 is Patriot Freight Group? What's good? Why are you guys over in uh over in Houston? So Patriot Freight Group, we're, we are a third-party logistics company. Um, our we actually started this company in, on July fourth. 2014 and we uh my business partner jonathan nutt and i actually started this company as a side hustle uh we were we were working in positions um in the oil and gas industry i was doing quality management logistics he was working in operations we're working for a high volume uh steel distributor um and just our background has always been in oil and gas and so we were shipping a lot of freight a lot of pipe a lot mm. of oil field tools um and we we saw a need here in specifically in Houston where you know we we were constantly having uh just some challenges in in this industry primarily flatbed um hot shots uh you know et cetera. And you Andrew, know, you know what, man, we, Andrew, Andrew, I don't mean to interrupt you. What you're saying, it's funny because I hear this story so many times when I sit yeah. up here and it's not and like, you know, I didn't really intend to get into freight. It wasn't really my plan. But the problem I understood was someone needs to be doing this. Someone needs to do this service for the industry. And very quickly, you're like, well, first of all, this is a full time job. Maybe that's why someone needs to give it all its attention. But this is a company that we can build around. Now, we're going to get into the, the logistics of laying pipe, but. I also want to highlight companies that are hiring and you put a post up that's hiring. We have some pictures of your team here. They just got some brand new swag. Like I did, if you want to show some of these off, but talk a little bit about the team that you're building for those out there in the area that are looking for their new job. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're very focused on, on the brand and what Patriot stands for. Um, you know, we, we are in the process of, or we have done some reorganizing here over the last 12 months where we have a, a strategic plan for some major growth here over the next three to five years. And, you know, it's very important that, you know, as a brand, uh, you know, we market that, we market that well. And ultimately we, we want to market as our business as, as just a good place to work. Wow. You know, we want, we want people, you know, we want to develop a culture where, you know, people are motivated. People are, you know, content with coming to work every day, You're putting in 100%, you know, grit, perseverance, you know, all that stuff that we talk about. Well, we, we really, we're really working towards on putting that into action. Um, and then, Who are you looking for? What, what kind of, like, what are you hiring yeah. for right now, Andrew? What, what kind of people? So right now we're hiring for, you know, for agents, like internal agents, you know, we're, we don't, we're not an agent model, but you know, freight brokers. We're looking sure. at hiring, you know, hiring brokers that freight slangers, you know, freight slangers, you know, somebody <laughs> who, who's got, you know, that, that entrepreneurial mindset, but you know, they don't have to have experience. You know, we, we have training, we have training programs that are, that, that we give you the tools and the resources to be able to be successful in this industry. We're, we're very, very focused on training. We're focused on, um, you know, uh, growth, employee growth, professional growth, um, financial opportunities. Andrew, you know, Andrew, Andrew, let's let's take a look at some of the freight they would be working with, because that's cool, too. Like, we can talk right. all we want, but let's put some context to this. Let's show them some big-ass pipes. Like, for example, you got the Super Mario Warp pipe over here on a flatbed. By the way, I do a series called Rate the Strap Work. It's usually awful strap work that I highlight, so I have not shown uh, one of your rigs on there yet. Go back to the first one with the Super Mario pipe. Tell me what we're looking at here. What do you guys do out there? So this is for a client that actually does um, some uh, specialized cleanup on on job sites. So it's usually 
Um, they're usually dealing with hazardous material. So this looks like it was a large job. Looks like it, it was in uh, Laporte, uh, Texas, you know, over there, right, right outside the, uh, the coast a little bit. And, um, yeah, so this, this client pretty much, I mean, they, they are hooking up those, the, those flanges together. And I mean, they, they are pumping hazardous waste off this job site. And, um, you know, that's just many, one of the many things that we do, we, we ship a lot of, you know, oil field pipe, um, a lot of our oil field customers, uh, you know, it's a, it's a different language when it comes to shipping oil field, uh, there, there's, there's the lingo. And, um, you know, if you, if you can understand the lingo, if you, if you know, you know, what the part does, how it works, you know, this really develops a trust and being able to get things done, but also having an understanding of, um, you know, how critical that part is to a job. This is so some, this is some big, this is some big high touch freight. And if, and if you see some of these pictures, like, like the next one, you're going out to some locations. You're not just going on the highway and pulling to a dock off the side of the road. What do you guys have to consider? What is it that makes this so different than regular freight that needs a specialized carrier like Patriot? So there's a lot of compliance requirements that compliance and safety is going to be key when you're moving this, when you're moving this material. Um, <laughs> Usually when you're going out to a rig site, you're not going to have a whole lot of information. Um, you know, coordinates only get you so far. Uh, sometimes, you know, that you, you might have a handwritten map with a, <laughs> with a turn left here and go right at the fork in the road to be able to find some of these places. And it's, it's critical to, to understand all these requirements because a lot, of, a lot of individuals that work in the oil field work off very little information. So, you know, being able to piecemeal kind of like a private investigator or, you know, so, someone like that. I mean, you got to piecemeal a lot of information to be able to meet uh, these requirements and, and understanding the commodities is is um, one of those major aspects that, that you have to have in order to get this stuff delivered right. Uh, with that, you know, also PPE. Everyone's got different PPE requirements. Everyone, you know, um, different languages. We have a very... Um, you know, heavy Spanish community here in in Houston. You know, moving freight, moving this freight all over the country. So being able to, um, you know, communicate um, appropriately to whoever, however, what language they're speaking. I mean, there's there's just a lot of details that go into getting the freight delivered once that freight is actually on the truck. You know, I've only been to Houston once and it flooded. Is uh, is that is that true? Does it flood all the time over there? Because when I was there, they're like, hey, you got to look out for the flooding. And the one time I was there, it actually did flood. But I don't want to think bad on Houston if I, if I just had my one time there. Well, uh, it, maybe not as much as it did in, uh, you know, a few years ago with, uh, with Harvey. And, you know, when we get a downpour, if it's just moving slow, then, yeah, it'll flood. There's this there's a lot of construction uh, Houston is growing. All the suburbs are growing. So <laughs> the challenge there is, is that where all this water, uh, used to go if they're, they're putting neighborhoods and building towns, but it's great for the city. Um, you know, Houston continues to grow. Houston continues to be the ener energy capital of the world. We bring in, um, uh, millions of pounds of steel pipe in from, uh, into the port of Houston that we do store at our, at our, uh, five acre yard up in Houston. Um, and we do that consistently on a monthly basis. Um, very cool. So there's, there's well, hey. just a, go ahead. Well, Andrew, let me ask you, people who want to go, they got to want to go work for you or they need some help with the very challenging logistics of oil fields in the energy sector. Where do I send them to? So you can send them to our website. It's a uh, patriot dash freight.com slash jobs. Excellent. Andrew, hey, thank you so much. I'll have you back on again soon. We'll go deeper into your most challenging low, but I appreciate you coming on saying letting some people know about what's available out there and why Houston is a great place to work. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Dooner. Appreciate it. Take care. All right. Do you remember right. we mentioned AIT's Global Transportation Market Report earlier in the show? Capacity and pricing trends, air, ocean, and trucking, economic insights, extra, etc. Well, what do you do once you have all that useful data analysis? You turn insights into action. That's right. Partner with AIT's global network of subject matter experts, and they'll design a supply chain solution 
tailored to your needs. Get started today at AITWorldwide.com. But right now, I'm going to get started with Lori Ann LaRocco. She's a senior editor of guests over at CNBC. She's also a Freight Waves columnist. She also makes good LinkedIn posts. You might see her on social media. She's also an author. But Lori Ann, I got to ask you too. I was looking. Containers don't lie. Now that came out in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Interesting year because a lot has happened since. And I got me wondering, are you writing that next book already? Are you writing about what happened during the pandemic? I'm not because I have no time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> between between CNBC and, and Freight Waves, it's, it's insanity. I have thought about it. I am writing another book right now that's not logistics related. And so I think once I get that baby to bed, I'm going to start doing it. But it's almost like that's to be continued, right? Like even with the trade war, we're still in it. And, you know, it's still impacting the flow of trade. So I've got to figure it all out. Wait, what is this? What is this other book about? That's not about freight. It's about we're actually interviewing. It's so very different than what I do. Uh, my daughter and I are co-authoring a book. We're actually interviewing descendants whose loved ones were enslaved. And oh, wow. so it's a very, very different topic, and we're really thrilled about it, and uh, hopefully it'll be out soon. So you, you only pick the lightweight subjects here, Lori. <laughs> you're, going, you're going heavy. Global trade wars, yes. But you're doing, you're doing the Lord's work out there. I, I was reading one of your most recent articles, and um, you know a lot of people have been trying to make sense of holiday retail sales. It's always up 5%, but to everyone that was with inflation and everything, it was, that was tepid, right? It was tepid at best. And when you really talk to a lot of the operators, yep. they didn't seem – to be too happy. Everyone was like, yeah, I got a minor boost. I know a lot of e-com stars are like, you know what? Yeah, Black Friday through yeah. Cyber Monday was good, but it died immediately afterwards and we're right back where we started. What are some of the trends that you are identifying? I know you've seen four of them. I, I have. And so, you know, with the audience here, uh, they may not realize, but the rest of the world doesn't get it that logistics gets paid per unit, right? Per piece of freight that they move. And so that's why I really wanted to look at the pipes of plumbing. And so one of the first pieces that I looked at was warehouses, because we all know that all of the products that were front loaded in for the holidays back in uh, March, April and May, because remember, they all wanted to avoid the, the congestion over the summer. And so it got me thinking and I started looking at as early as October to see how much of that product would move from the warehouse and go into the retail stores. And it was flat at best in October. And November and December, there really wasn't a, a, a pop, if you will. What did move were the luxury items and the e-commerce. And so fast forward a month or two later, that's the news that we're seeing. And so that's why I really want the world to kind of look at logistics as a forward-looking indicator as to the real-time aspect. And so that was one of the biggest things that I looked at. And then, of course, the and so on effect, which is trucking, which, as we all know, they uh, folks moved less because you had stuff moving out of less moving out of the warehouses. Right. And you also have less freight coming in um, off the ports. You know, warehouses are an interesting thing because they're they can be a, a bit of a paradox and it's not always intuitive. The mm -hmm. cost of them can go way up when you have a ton of freight moving in and out because there's no space, but they can also go it, it, they can also go way up when you have too much inventory and no freight's moving at all. And that's actually the worst kind for shippers because they're paying a ton of money on stuff that's not moving and there's not a ton of demand. Well, demand is indicator number two on your list. That's manufacturing orders. Yeah. What do they tell us about what's in the pipeline? It's it's really thin. You know, you're looking at anywhere of 40 to 50 percent down. And what's really scary here, folks, is the fact that with uh, China and COVID, you know, earlier this month, you had factories. And I saw the correspondence. Factories were telling the logistics providers, we can't make the product because we don't have enough people. And you have to really think about that. They're working on orders that are almost half of what they are used to making and they can't get it done. And so that is something we really have to keep uh, looking at and then compounding it when you're looking at the manufacturing orders, that also goes on the and so on effect with the ocean freight. And ocean mm. freight, as you know, with freight waves, you can see it's down almost 50% from six months ago. Yes, yeah, throw up that chart. We have an ocean bookings chart here in uh, in Sonar, yeah. and you can you can you can see sort of where this cliff happened, where where it fell off, and where yeah. it's kind of the baseline. It's kind of been 
stuck at. Uh, it's it's interesting. So there was there was an article in a, another paper that said, despite the weakness, despite the weakness, carriers are still going to try to get top dollar in their ocean contracts. And it comes <laughs> that article came at a curious time because there's a meeting in Long Beach in about a in about a month that um, I'm sure the carriers yeah. would love shippers to believe that. I don't agree with that at all. What do you think is going to happen in this booking space when we look at contracts? Because bid seasons now. Well, exactly. And, and and the sad thing is, you know, you also have to factor in this stage uh, factory roll-up with their employees. So employees aren't coming back until the end of February and the beginning of March, which means that product is not going to be – new product will be rolling out until earliest, what, the end of March, beginning of April. That impacts ocean orders. So where the heck are they going to flex their muscles – to say you're going to pay top dollar, they're not going to be able to. And, you know, I, 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 I do a lot with uh, Zenata because they're one of the CNBC supply chain heat map providers. You know, and Peter Sand saying it's way too early to tell to mm. talk about, you know, freight rates. I mean, how can you when there is no demand to bring things in? And not even that, China can't make the product because people are sick. So, you know, those are things that are at, that's out of everybody's control. And on top of it, we do not know how big of a explosion we'll see, right, with these COVID cases. And more importantly, it's like it's going into the rural, rural areas where the workers, you know, that's where their parents live. Are they going to stay home and take care of their sick loved one? You and I, we don't know, and neither do their employers. So until we know what's going on, how the heck can we actually say that ocean carriers are going to get top dollar? Sure. You know, and you're talking about China, a place we don't necessarily trust the data out of. And you're talking about carriers that made a lot of money that suddenly aren't where disruption is good for business. They learn that very well. So you have to be cautious with this. And we're already seeing it. So like, you know, in a team like the Jacksonville Jaguars, before they made the playoffs, when they were bad, if they couldn't sell enough tickets, they put big tarps up over their seats and they would blank those seats to artificially keep the price of their tickets there and not to make it look empty. Well, in shipping, we do something similar. It's called blank sailings. And if you look at this chart in the beginning of 2023 leading up to Chinese New Year. This is compared yep. to 2019. So That's you right. wanted to take pre-pandemic data, something that is in- altered at all by pandemic data, and on the other side of it, and you can see just how hard they're fighting here for that cost control. Yeah. Well, and, and and it's it's amazing because it's not enough. I mean, when you look at according to Zenata, they've blanked six times the amount. Okay, mm. six times the amount compared to 2019 over this time. Now, I talked to Peter and I said, you know, the, the numbers are great, but have we factored in the tremendous amount of capacity that has been added to the fleets, right? Because they've had these bigger, better, stronger, whatever you want to call it, vessels, right? They can carry more uh, containers. And so it, while we could say that six times the amount has been uh, canceled, we have to factor in how many extra vessels that are out there that carry more TEUs. And so that's also going to be very interesting as well, because you've got these new vessels coming in. You know what, though? DHL, they had some green shoots. So it's interesting. So I'm starting. I'm, I'm very excited now and I'm yeah. getting excited because debate is starting yeah. to to heat up again around supply chain. Everyone already accepts that we're in a down market. It's going yeah. down that that debate's over. But now we're, we're arguing about when is it coming back? And there's team, you know, spring, yeah. June-ish that we see the green shoots. Craig Fuller's on there. I believe the CEO of DHL is also, according to your article. What are they what are they seeing that makes them think that the second half of the year is going to be um a recovery period. Yeah, sure. So I spoke with the head of DHL supply chain for North America, just so the audience knows. And, you know, we were talking about the warehousing issue. We were talking about all of this. And he says that based on what they're seeing with their orders. Now, remember, DHL, they kicked butt last year. And so when freight, when, uh, what was it, FedEx came out and everybody was like wringing their hands saying, oh my goodness, you know, is the world ending because of you know, FedEx being a supposed barometer. DHL did very, very well. DHL told me that they're anticipating a stronger consumer in the mid uh, to end of the second quarter. And so that kind of really aligns if you think about it, because by then they too told me that they're expecting more of a ramp up of orders coming in into the United States in April. And that co-aligns with what I've been hearing in terms of the stage, you know, rollout with the employees, with it, um, you know, with manufacturing, get you know, getting back in there. So there are some green shoots, and I would rather point to a DHL than a FedEx. 
in all honesty, when it comes to looking at the pulse of the consumer. Makes sense. Makes sense, especially when you're talking uh, about overseas knowledge, too. Um, I like it. You know, Craig Fuller, he just tweeted uh, yesterday, imports declined 16.5% in December, just slightly lower than 16.7% decline in November. These are the largest import contractions in history. So um, it's getting it's getting scant and it's getting quiet out there. So we could use some more freight. We're all I'm look, I'm hoping for June. I hope that that June, the spring, uh, the summer recovery happens. Thank you so much, Lorianne, for coming on the show. I appreciate your time. Say, people who want to read your articles, they want to get your books, or um, they want to follow you, where should I send them to? Um, you know, LinkedIn's a great catch-all. So you could find me on LinkedIn and, you know, hit the follow button there. Uh, but also, too, like with CNBC, it's kind of ubiquitous. And then with Great Waves, you know, you guys know how to get me for my column for American Shipper. Well, hey, congratulations to you and your daughter, too. I think that's wicked cool that you Thank are you. working with her on a book. Let me know when that comes out. I have dreams of doing things like that with my sons when they get a little bit older. It's great. I definitely will. No, Take care. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye. All right. Let's see here. So, you know, I again, like I tell you guys, I wish that was better news. At least we were a little bit hopeful on this one. I know Tom was Tom Albrecht when he was on on Friday. He was like, you look trucking side, at least prepare for 2024. Um, I, I hope Lorianne and Craig Fuller are more right when they're with their optimistic takes, but we're going to keep eyes on. I mean, that's what we keep an eye on. That's when we call the freight market going down, what we're looking at, I mean, this, this data isn't like invisible. It doesn't come out of nowhere. If something's not booked overseas, right? If there's not these ocean bookings, it's not like they can show up at the ports. These things have to happen. And then you have, you know, 15 to 30 day window or 120 day window during COVID, depending for the boat to arrive. So if you want the quickest data, you need the high frequency data because that's the stuff that I'll tell you what happened. Who cares about reading an article about something that happened 120 days ago? Oh, the free market in November did this. What is that going to do? That doesn't make me money. That does nothing. That's nothing to me. All right. Let's get to a conspiracy in the caves. Play this video. TikTok, just a quick update. It's uh, Saturday, I believe. And uh, here's the truck I've been driving for the last few days uh, for Wilson Logistics. Um, this trailer just uh, was assigned to us from Kraft over at the Kraft uh, Foods plant, and we're delivering it here to what's called the Springfield Underground. And that is, as you can see behind me, this giant, giant cave that's big enough to house hundreds of these trucks and trailers. There's a train track running through here. Just to give you an idea, back here, there's a regular sized truck See how tall that is up there. Um, it's just incredible. Anyway, having a great time learning lots. Talk to you soon. All right, this place is like catnip for conspiracy theorists. A lot of people in the comments saw this video posted in line. There's one here. Her name is Jen. She says, they're called DUMBS, D-U-M-B-S, Deep Underground Military Bases. And the first guy to whistleblow about them wound up dead. He, they're a huge rabbit hole. And there's an alleged tunnel system beneath the Getty Museum that includes supersonic trains. Okay, what does the other person say here? Uh, Saved by Grace says, all the conspiracy about trafficking children comes to mind. Uh, Barbara Graham says, well, if people can't get any food in the future, they can go get some from here. I'm being serious. This is their plan. They all had a longstanding plan. So this shows us how long they intend to starve us. Thank you so much for exposing this. I'm not really sure how it does that, but uh, we got Lee and Adam Whistler who says, yes, you have to ask yourself, why are they stockpiling food people need in day-to-day -day life? Underground and what appears to be storage bunkers. Are they preparing for catastrophe that we don't know about? Or are they creating an artificial deficit in the food chain? Guys, they are doing the opposite. They are keeping an artificial deficit from going into the supply chain at the food supply chain at a 3.5% million dollar square foot facility called the Springfield Underground. Although, you know, Kraft Pepsi, they use a lot of cold food chain. Although, you know, Super Trucker, he used to be a deep, deep state trucker. And he was in this thread and he kept being like, no, it's real. It was seven months ago. So that made me a little suspicious. Uh, let's take a look at this team driving over here. Tell me if you uh, would draw the short straw and end up where this guy is. And if you take a look at him, yes, he is underneath the trailer. 
<laughs> on that giant girder. See this long ass girder over here. There's a driver all the way on the other end. He's got to sit under there. And if you look at that dude, the only protection he has, the only PPP he has is a beard and a beanie. He doesn't have like a windscreen or anything. Now, it doesn't even look like he's got a communicator if like a pebble came up and knocked him in the face. Anyway, can the tape. Here's a great one that was made online by uh, Hacer Kun. This is all the OSHA violations that Boston Dynamics robots are doing. Roll the tape. I don't know if you've seen this. So this guy's doing his hammer. And uh, apparently these robots again. that Boston Dynamics is making are supposed to help you out on the job site. Well, the first thing to do is remind that guy he shouldn't be wearing sneakers, especially while wielding a hammer within a warehouse. The next thing I notice is here is this board. But as you notice, does the robot pay any attention to that? Oh yeah, he does. He must be here to fix the violation. Robot picks it up. Is he a good worker though? No, he's a clown. He's jumping around in a circle. He makes himself a bridge here, which I believe is also a violation. In fact, it's four violations. And he's dancing around, lollygagging, chucking around bags of hammers. There has to be some sort of rule against this. And wait until what he does up here. Look at this, he's gonna throw this thing up the girder. I don't even, we even have time. We don't even have time to finish it. All right, we gotta get out of here. Don't be a stranger. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Tuner. Take care.